Well, thank, thank you for the invitation and thank you for coming. So I was, Dr. Glauber couldn't come and so they had a last okay. minute call uh, to, to ask me what I could uh, give the presentation. So who should we ablate and why? Of course, there, there, there is the easy answer, which of course is, is the, uh, the surgical answer, everybody, and why? Because it works. But that would be too easy and, and I have to talk 15 minutes. So I, I will try not to get you to that point, but to, to convince you that in a certain, let's say, uh, subset of, of patients, it, it, it makes sense, my disclosures. So I, I think the, the, the answer to the question is, is about knowing our trait. Uh, and, and that's one of the issues we have with uh, treating, treatment of atrial fibrillation, apart from, from those who are, I would say, uh, obsessed with it. Uh, I, I think that's the minority of, of uh, cardiac surgeons. Um, most of us uh, do have a, a certain knowledge of, of atrial fibrillation, but, but typically it is difficult to, to really know um, the trade of AF. And what, what is the reason why I think um, we as, uh, let's say, cardiothoracic surgeons, we, we, we should be involved in the field? And it's not because we are so good in it. That, that's not the reason. No. I think the, the, the main reason is, is because there is not so much alternatives there. And, and why is that? Because even on the EP side, where, where there's, let's say, many more patients available, much more, let's say, money involved and, and potential, uh, let's say, improvement of, of uh, devices, they still are with the same problem. And, and the problem they are confronting that even pulmonary vein isolation, as I would say the, 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 the brick, the, the, the building brick of, of every AF ablation, most of us will agree upon, they still have issues achieving that. The problem we are confronting in, in the, let's say, the modern surgical era is that we, I believe, do have ablation devices which can, let's say, uh, provide us uh, transmural lesions and continuous transmural lesions. But the problem is that we are still performing empirical procedures. Yeah? So we're performing a lesion set uh, which is based upon science, about knowledge, but not specifically on that patient's atrial fibrillation. Yeah? And that's what we are, let's say, confronted with. So we all know the incident of AF. And, and uh, I will not uh, take too much time on it, but what is important is if you look at the incidence, you look at the number of patients treated, there's under-treatment uh, that we all know. So there is, there is a, a reason, of course, uh, and, and that is something we should change. How to treat EF, of course, we are not alone in this field. There are different uh, possibilities to treat EF, but of course, the moment the patient is a concomitant patient on your operating table, it does make sense that you would provide, let's say, a surgical solution uh, to the patient. Why would we do it? That's one of my older slides, um, and, and <coughs> it's repetition, but why would we do it? Of course, because there, there are studies, uh, there's data available uh, to show us that it makes sense uh, to get rid of AF uh, and to get rid of it, of it off antithmic drugs, and that's also important. Why? Because there's an increase in mortality, stroke, and also congestive heart failure. And we may not underestimate the cost of AF. It's a very expensive disease, uh, certainly over, on, on the long run. This is a bit more, more elaborated. Uh, we, we, now, we now have several, let's say, studies uh, showing us that it does give uh, improvement of quality of life. There is, there is even a randomized controlled trial uh, from, from uh, Sweden who shows that there is a, a decreased stroke risk, heart failure risk, improved survival. This has been shown by several studies, have been published in several papers. I will show some of you later. But I do believe, for me, one of the major concerns is the symptoms of the patient. And, and if, if you are interested in arrhythmia surgery, uh, we, will, we will all realize that the patient you are, let's say, seeing at your consultation is not a regular patient. The patient with an arrhythmia issue is a patient who has a certain burden of symptoms with a certain psychological burden, uh, let's say, that, that goes together with, with his symptoms. I always say if you have a patient and he comes for a cabbage or, or, or a valve problem, even aortic disease, you, you, you can sell him the procedure in 10 minutes and he will be accepting and happy. If you have a patient with atrial fibrillation, he sticks with you half an hour, an hour, he has a file with him, with, and it's, a, it's an annoying patient, but that means that his burden is very important. So the way he lives his arrhythmia is, is, is very uh, important for him. And then, of course, we had the AFFIRM study, and, and this has shown that there is a reduction in mortality if patients are in sinus rhythm. The problem is if you give antithmic drugs, that reduction is, is let's say, uh, anidist uh, by the, by the uh, mortality probably created by the antithmic drugs. Uh, that's important. So should all patients with AF have an ablation? Well, these are the different, uh, let's say, questions 
typically a surgeon asks himself uh, if, if he sees a patient with atrial fibrillation and deciding whether uh, he will treat that atrial fibrillation as a concomitant pathology or not. So it's a type of atrial fibrillation. Uh, we, we have a tendency to, to, to think that paroxysmal is easier to treat and persistent easier than long-standing persistent. Duration of AF is important, but that means duration of AF in paroxysmal AF or duration of AF in persistent or long-standing persistent. That's something we, are, we do not all agree upon. It's not certainly the same. As a patient can be 25 years in paroxysmal AF. Is that the same as a patient with one year of long-standing persistent AF? Size of atria, yeah, that is probably important, yeah, the left and the right atrium size. Concomitant cardiac disease, yeah, what, what is the pathology behind the atrial fibrillation? Yeah, what, what are we treating? Age of the patient, yeah, we, we have a tendency to think yeah, if the patient is older, well, perhaps it's not worth it anymore to treat the atrial fibrillation. And certainly, if it's about life expectancy, and then, then atrial fibrillation is certainly a secondary matter for most of it. But what is the issue? So when we are deciding to, to, to treat atrial fibrillation, most of us will, uh, let's say, score the atrial fibrillation based on, on a mechanistic uh, classification. And, and that is annoying because a patient with paroxysmal AF or persistent or low-standing persistent AF doesn't mean that his pathology has evolved in a certain way that, is, that it became untreatable. A patient with a small left atrium with paroxysmal AF can be much tougher to treat than a patient with long-standing persistent AF and a, and, a, and a large atrium. And why is that? We don't know, but it probably means that the lesions that we are providing for that paroxysmal patient with a small atrium, which probably has, a, a, let's say, a, a very short refractory period with, with a, a short cycle length, so more difficult to treat atrial fibrillation, and perhaps that, that uh, long-standing persistent AF patient has a very easy uh, trigger coming from the pulmonary veins, which we can isolate uh, accordingly. So th that is one of the issues why it's so difficult to decide who to treat and who not to treat, because our classification will not help us in this, in this manner. So there are more difficult, of course, um, ways of, of, uh, of looking at the pathophysiology of atrial fibrillation. This is about electrical remodeling. Um, I think for most of us, important to understand, it's, it's, it's all about uh, action potential duration and it's about conduction slowing. And conduction slowing typically we correlate with fibrosis, uh, but it can be other, other reasons. So we have the same with structural remodeling. Uh, that's, we know that uh, with larger atria, with longer, let's say, uh, existence of the atrial fibrillation, there is structural remodeling, and, and, and we tend to think that in these patients the atrial fibrillation is more difficult uh, to treat, which can be the case. But we don't know for a given patient if that will be the case. So what do we have as a as, uh, as result? So why would we do it? Uh, we, 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 there, there has been um, a, uh, a meta-analysis, uh, let's say not so long ago, uh, performed, and, and we have 16 randomized controlled trials, which is not bad. Uh, we all, typically we hear that we don't have the data, uh, but we have 16 randomized controlled trials on concomitant AF in cardiac surgery. Um, not huge number of patients, uh, but, but the, the data is there. Most of them are including mitral valve surgery, yeah, of course, because of the number of uh, AF patients with mitral valve surgery is, is higher than with the other uh, diseases. Um, and there are different uh, ablation devices uses, used. Some of them are no longer on the market. So what is important? Well, sinus rhythm is higher at discharge at 12 months as shown by these randomized controlled trials. So that is important. So we can increase the number of patients in sinus rhythm. What is also important is that the, the, the 30 day all cause mortality is not different. So, adding uh, the, the procedure to the, uh, to the cardiac primary procedure is not adding upon mortality, not adding upon neurological events, uh, but also on the long term. So, it's not improving but not worsening. And there's no difference in pacemaker implantation if you look at these randomized control trials. So, the conclusion, of course, is that it is a viable treatment option that the, the mid, short, mid, and long term, but long term is one year, uh, are, are, are good. But I think what is also interesting is that in these trials, 10 of them had information about thromboembolic uh, risk and, and the medication, and there we don't see a difference. So apparently, uh, there was no, in, in these randomized controls, controlled trials, no improvement in the neurological events, whether or not. I think for us as surgeons, this is the most important paper. Uh, it's the, it's the uh, ISMIC's consensus statement, uh, and, and Dr. Ed, who is here in the room, is, uh, was the uh, first author of that paper. And, and, and it is important uh, because this is, let's say, the, 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 the highest paper, I would say, we have available uh, to, to make our point. And, and 
What is nice about it uh, is it's about patients with persistent and permanent AF because most of us will not argue about paroxysmal AF uh, because paroxysmal AF typically we should do something which would be at least pulmonary vein isolation but I, I guess most of us will do that but you can see uh, that there are different reasons to do it uh, so we know increased incidence of sinus rhythm class 1 uh, level A not bad I will show you the ESC guidelines later you have to remember this Reduce the risk for stroke, class 2A, level B. Improve the X-infection, exercise tolerance, long-term survival, 2A, level A or B. <coughs> if you now look at the ESC guidelines, so from the cardiologist uh, uh, point of view, it is 2010. Uh, it has been updated uh, recently, but this, this is 2010. In fact, there is very limited, uh, um, let's say, uh, pages uh, available. There's only one page on the, on the concomitant uh, AF, uh, and there's only uh, three articles to which they refer to. Right? So, so it's a very limited uh, uh, information you get from that, but these are the cardiologists referring us the patient, so it's important to know what they think. And this is their recommendation, and most of us will know these recommendations by head, of course. But interesting, uh, it's 2AA, and in asymptomatic patients, 2BC. Uh, so, so for them, not as strong as we would say in our, uh, let's say, in our societies. Interestingly, I think it's always wondering for me uh, how, how, can you, uh, how can you class of recommendation and level of evidence change depending upon the, let's say, the people looking at the data. It's the same data, and, and apparently we have different uh, conclusions coming out of that data. These are some of the articles I just wanted to, to share. Uh, which, which, um, which are showing uh, that late survival is improved, uh, there's, a, there's, there's a decrease in mortality. And then to conclude, I think one of the issues we are also confronted with is, is, is of course, what lesion set we are, we are going to provide. And that's also the reason uh, who uh, is, is uh, a candidate for, for AF procedure. So is, is who, the candidate, always a maze procedure? Uh, or do, can we provide something else? But because I do believe, and I know we can, we can discuss about this, but I do believe that, that there are surgeons who are reluctant to perform an AF procedure because they, they either think I do nothing or I have to do a maze procedure. I think a maze procedure is too much, perhaps the best solution, but too much uh, for, for my patient or in my hand, so I will not provide anything. So the question is, can we offer something else than the maze procedure? And that is, of course, a difficult question. But I, I do believe what we do have to, to understand in, in the maze procedure, and, and, and I do maze all the time too, there's nothing wrong with the maze procedure, but we have to understand that the maze procedure was designed, and it was Dr. Cox himself who, who, who wrote this, uh, this uh, designed uh, in, in, in a moment where, the, 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 let's say, the available data uh, on, on the uh, electrophysiology or the pathophysiology of atrial fibrillation was limited, and he called it himself a cell procedure. That doesn't mean it has, uh, let's say, lost part of its value. It means that perhaps in some patients we can do less and we can take our time to learn the procedure stepwise and not start with a maze immediately if you, do, if you don't feel comfortable with it, but start with uh, something less and then build up. So to end, so we, we still have several questions. So it's not everybody is a candidate. And, and I think in order to answer that question, we, we have to better understand the pathophysiology, uh, not in the total number of patients, but in the given patient that is lying on your table, we have to discuss about the optimal ablation approach, the lesion set, the energy source. Uh, there are not too many players anymore on the market uh, for surgical AF ablation. Uh, only two real companies left. Uh, so they, they do have, a, let's say, a, 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 a tough grip on the market. Uh, so this is difficult. And of course, you always have to discuss with your cardiologist. And if you see from the ESC guidelines, they don't think the same as we do. That is clear. So my conclusion would be that the real interest of ablation lies not in a judgment, it's not the way we judge it, but it's in, in its methodology and its outcomes, and that's something we still have to work on. Thank you.